This is the first comprehensive survey of buyers' performances in a U.S. museum. Yet, of course, at the same time, it contains none of buyers' work. Right. the idea that um, MoCAD would do an exhibition of James E. Bias, one of the most well-known, influ most influential artists coming out of Detroit in the last 50 to 60 years. In the process of doing that, um, I thought about who could curate the show, or who could I have to work with me on the show, and uh, Triple Candy, a collective of two art historians, uh, came to mind. And Triple Candy had been for the last 10 to 15 years worked on a number of exhibitions that looked at uh, single artists, monographic exhibitions, but in a very unusual way. We, we got frustrated, you know. We said to ourselves, well, there has to be another way where we can do a show about an artist that we want to do a show about without actually having to have to go through those channels, you know, without going through the galleries and the, you know, and the dealers and the money. It was with the David Hammond show that we did in 2005 where we said, well, we're going to do a retrospective of his work, because it's never been done, with photocopies. And, and that was our first uh, attempt, and I, we were both really worried about what would happen. Uh, whereas they were very criticized for doing the shows with David Hammonds and even more so with Katie Nolan. What does it mean if other people remake work? Um, but of course it touches upon a lot of issues that linger around in the making of art in the 20th century. The idea of the ready-made, the idea of what is authorship. Even if the shows were ostensibly about a single artist's work, we were also really trying to surface or um, question or examine the ways that artists become known, how their stories are told, why their stories are told certain ways, what stories are not being told. MoCAD has been trying to do a James Lee Byer show since they opened, and there are so many issues around his work, there's no way you can get it um, unless you have, you know, climate control and you have connections, and, um, and a lot of the work that's available is his later work, which most art historians are not interested in anyway. Um, and the early work, which is performative and fleeting, which, yeah. is raises all sorts of questions that a lot of people are asking the, yeah. about how do you re-perform performances years later, uh, the ethics of that, and then even the questions around which performances even happened. He would say perhaps that he would um, do a three-day walk through the desert on his own but there was no one to actually say whether or not he actually did that. There is in his biography, it says that he studied at Wayne State University, and we went to the admissions office at Wayne State and tried to figure out if there ever was a student with the name James Lee Bias at Wayne State, and we didn't find any proof. His whole life, in some way, was a performance, and you never really knew what was fact and what was fiction. The setup of the show, we had a little bit in mind that we would be an amateur theater group and that we wanted to stage a play about James Lee Byers. So there's, for example, an area in the exhibition that is a casting uh, agency where we invite people to come for castings of the character of James Lee Byers. And we outlined what characteristics that character of James Lee Bias has to have with different images that you would find in a casting agency. And there's a video of someone being cast as the ghost of James Lee Bias. My favorite piece, which is you know, probably the piece that we talk about a lot, which has very little to do with James Lee Byers. <laughs> Although it does, in an abstract way, is the, is the curtain, of course, because that was such a huge labor um, we did in our apartment that was so small. The curtain is 
it's the it's the entrance and the exit, you know, this man who was both revered and, and dismissed by Detroit and really the, the country. You know, most of his um, success came from overseas. It's situated in a setting that's meant to evoke a ruined theater, which is supposed to, which we hope reverberate somewhat with the cultural landscape of Detroit. And it's the vestiges and artifacts of its own past. We're countering his reverence for perfection and his interest in that concept of perfection, which this was, was very something central that to his work. We talked about all the time we were installing. It's like perfect. Is this perfect? Because he did that. <laughs> he did a uh, performance called, you know, perfect, perfect. performances yeah. to stand still. The perfect, <laughs> yeah. yes, perfect kiss. So you were very, you know, conscientious. The about show's that. decidedly imperfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though a lot of this work doesn't look like his work, there's something about it that makes us think about him. Does that make sense? In the past, when we've been offering editorial commentary on a subject um, of an artist, it's usually been in, embedded in the wall text. Yeah. Um, this show, I think that the commentary is embedded in the objects themselves. So the objects are hopefully, they're not at all, you know, straightforward appropriation. They're not recreations at all. They're quite altered. And the altering is meant to editorialize on a subject.